Welcome to Human Factors Cast, your weekly podcast for all things human factors, psychology, and design. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to continuing our coverage of HFES 2018. We are joined today by, well, Woodrow Gustafson is here also, in addition to Blake and myself. And we also have David Azari here. And David is the uh, Alphonse Chapanis Best Student Paper Award recipient. Uh, we all thought I was going to trip up over that, but I well nailed done. it, guys. I nailed it. Well done. <laughs> well done. Nice. <laughs> so one thing you might notice uh, to our listeners, we didn't have this thing posted. So Woodrow... You actually met up with David and, and kind of pulled him in. So uh, what we're going to talk about today is kind of your involvement with the paper and just to kind of talk about it. So Blake and I know nothing about it. So if we ask any sort of questions that are a little no duh, I mean, you know, just, just bear with us here. <laughs> so I, w- I want to talk, David, um, kind of about your experience in Human Factors and, and what kind of uh, specialty you have. Sure. Uh, well, the last six years I've been working at the University of Wisconsin in the Ergonomics and Biomechanics Lab. And as a part of that effort, we've been using computer vision to explore performance and quantifying surgical movement in the operating room. So looking at surgeons of varying expertise, what they do, how they do it well, and seeing if we can objectively assess in a, in a meaningful setting. So could you give us like a, a short overview of really what computer vision means and how it's being applied to that side? Yeah. Well, we, we've been lucky at the University of Wisconsin and working with uh, my advisor, Robert Radwin, to collaborate with the electrical and computer engineering folks. And, you know, we do a lot of image processing and edge segmentation, looking at video, looking at pixel flow rates and trying to see, you know, what attributes of an image can be tracked over time and how okay. we can train the computer to just recognize features in uh, something that, you know, it's easy for a human to recognize, but it's, it's a very non-trivial problem for a, for a computer to do so. Right, so you're looking at trends, right? Like, or, or specifically trends, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> 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 These are the stupid uh, questions that I said I'd ask. <laughs> <laughs> well, tre- perhaps, yeah, trends. Uh, so there's trends in a video, let's say, uh, of movement, but we're also looking at trends over the course of a career. So we're looking at performance as someone gains. You know, you start as a student, you become a resident, you become an attending physician. How do you perform over time? What skills do you gain over years and years of practice? You know, colloquially, people say 10,000 hours. Well, what does that mean quantitatively? And uh, our research strives to answer that question using a combination of tools of engineering, human factors, and within a framework of, uh, of cognitive. And so, if I understand right, then if you can if you can uh, figure out the trends and, and where they're going, you can also figure out the decline, right? Um, with that, so that that could be potentially a really good avenue to, to explore as well. Ideally, ideally, and what you know, one of the interesting things about surgery, people aren't uh, you know, when they start, they aren't monitored progressively over time, really. So, timing of retirement, facilitation of a decay, eventually in a career, isn't quantitatively assessed either. It's kind of left up to judgment, and yes, ideally we could detect in the longer term a decay of skill, perhaps to facilitate timing of retirement or timing of transition into a different professional domain. And this becomes a very significant, we're talking about civilians transitioning into active duty military service or vice versa, with uh, the different skills required on the battlefield and different skills required in the OR, such as laparoscopy. Hmm. Do you have a question? Yeah, so I mean, could <laughs> yeah, you, go ahead, Blake. Could you yeah. even take that in the reverse? Like looking at what it takes to get to that 10,000 hour point, like beyond just thinking of it as a span of time, are you able to actually, you know, kind of use what you can see or what computer vision can tell you in these cases and kind of front load how you train people or inform other applications? Absolutely. Uh, A a big part of my dissertation work is looking at what features quantitatively, what measures of speed, what measures of of frequency and the acceleration signal, what transformations we can use and, and... what features really are commensurate with people at those different levels. So we try and use it as a ground truth. Say, okay, if you're a physician, an attending role, and you've already been kind of been validated in the professional community, what is it that you do, and how is that different from somebody who's just starting? Because if we can match the kinematic profiles between these two populations, perhaps we can smooth out the learning curve. And that means huh. less substandard surgeries early. Because everybody, you know, simulations are fantastic, but physicians still agree that you have to practice on living tissue and we'd like to minimize the amount of time that that practice can be dangerous 
Most definitely. I yeah. feel like that's something a lot of us don't think about. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you have to ramp up to be like a good surgeon. It's right. like, certainly, certainly. Yeah. And, and surgeons, talk, yeah. surgeons talk about <laughs> reaching a, a plateau after a few years. So we'd like to be able to extend that. And you know, after you know, some research suggests that after ten years, uh, a stable point in surgical performance is reached. Well, perhaps we can we can make that earlier. And so people who you know people who need surgery aren't practiced upon as as clearly practice. So I want to jump in kind of into the uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna mess this up again because you said I would the Alphon Chapanis Best Student Paper Award. So I was hoping that you could tell us a little bit about this, uh, just a short description to catch everyone up. Well, do you want to Woodrow? Do you want to take the about the award? The, uh, the no, award? I'll, I'll, I'll let the, you take. <laughs> <laughs> Well, Al- Alphonse Chapanis is uh, really kind of a titan of, you know, at the time it wasn't, I don't think, human factors as well. And uh, there's some really great articles he's written. And uh, I encourage people to look up uh, some of the, the latest articles where he gave a very good breadth of overview of the field and where it was going. Um, you know, and at the time it worked very, you know, quintessential areas of Bell Labs and a lot of, um, you know, aviation following World War II. And, you know, he's just a very prolific academic and and uh, just professional in the field i don't know if that answers your question uh, well i mean your specific research i think oh, my yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, <laughs> I about <laughs> well hey that's, that's, that's great background, background. So that's okay. why when you asked yeah. me to explain it i was like I, i'm not the expert i didn't write the paper <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i would like you to explain that <laughs> yeah. no so, so, so my paper looked at uh, we we set up clinical simulations we set up just a foam dressing very simple foam foam dressing attached to wood block and we asked people to suture and tie on that material that's something every surgeon has to do. They have to be able to suture and tie. They have to do it on a variety of tissues that are very sensitive and in a variety of postures. You, know, you can imagine if you're operating deep in the body cavity, there's some variety, you know, the joint angles there can be pretty difficult. You have to maintain tension at the right force so you don't you know, tear sure. sensitive material. And so you have to be able to suture in all these techniques in all these ways, but we're looking at an easy to reproduce simulation foam dressing on a wood block, everybody can access. I set up video cameras to record hand motions, uh, and we apply our computer vision techniques and look at edge segmentation and motion tracking. Uh, recently, some of the work coming out of the ergonomics and biomechanics lab at Wisconsin, we, we were looking at uh, Bayesian motion prediction as well to anticipate the next likely location of a hand movement. And that has helped us to anticipate where the hands will be and that allows us to populate a feature set at 30 hertz. So 30 times a second, we can see where the hands are, allows us to populate a feature set, and then we can start to look at the differences in population. That's what that paper focuses on, is the difference between a resident in their fifth year and a resident who's just starting and a medical student who just started their clinical training hands-on in sure. the third year. So, so what did you find? Obviously, there's differences between the groups. <laughs> or hopefully, right? Uh, you would hope, <laughs> right? Hope. Yeah. Would hope. Don't yeah. tell us if there's not. <laughs> no. <laughs> nope, no or significant difference. We, can, <laughs> you know, we, we were looking at how surgeons perform there quantitatively, and we saw uh, stability, uh, increasing stability in path length per cycle. So, and conservation of movement as well. So this kind of matches a kind of an intuitive, well, experts are more efficient. And... Uh, people who have more experience are, are learning to do more with less movement. They're conserving more movement. And quantitatively, I encourage everybody to look at the paper to see, you know, what kinematic features are indicative of that. Uh, you know, the, the peak arrival rate and acceleration signal, for instance, can be indicative of the amount of conservation of energy and conservation of movement. But interestingly, these features are picked up by experts who watch the clips. So when you sit an expert attending, and I'm saying expert as someone who has more than right, three right. years, because the definition of expert um, has been debated for right. really millennia. 10,000 hours or whatever. Still, yeah. still Ten absolutely. Years, whatever. Still, absolutely. And I take, uh, you know, that's a big discussion as well in my dissertation, the first chapter. But when you take somebody who has achieved that professional recognition of expertise, when they sit down and watch these video clips, they're able to pick out, you know, what makes a more fluid or more economical or better tissue handling motion. And we ask them to rate these clips. And so now we're in the position where, with those expert-generated ratings, we can train the computer to duplicate. So we can train the computer to act as a proxy evaluator. Now, it wouldn't hmm. serve as a judge entirely. This wouldn't say that somebody is you know, a good surgeon off the bat. But it would augment the amount of quantitative information somebody has in a coaching setting. So when you sit down with your coach, let's say you're trying to learn how to suture, you could, with this algorithm and our work, have a kinematic report card 
and you could share that kinematic report card with your coach. And they could perhaps suggest an intervention or share some wisdom from the field, share some wisdom they have picked up in the OR and help you out to the next stage. So it's kind of like a diagnostic training tool. Formative you, feedback assessment. Yeah. That's right. It's awesome. It's at, in a quantitative means. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not just somebody watching you and trying to give you, you know, pointed feedback as they can. And I still think it's interesting that you saw, talking to experts, that even they're able to pick out across videos what's being done differently. Because usually a lot of in expertise, the thing that people say is that they're not necessarily able to communicate all of the steps or mental knowledge they have about what is making them experts. Yeah. They just kind of like have these mental models or patterns that they go that's through. Right. So that's really awesome. Well, if, if you're interested in the, the kind of more broadly what comprises skill in surgical, uh, there's, a, there's a phenomenal paper by Madani in 2017 looks at the domains of skill performance, domains of surgical skill. And, and they did a full cognitive task analysis and literature review to break out what attributes compli comprise surgical skill. And so they did a lot of the groundwork um, in establishing a framework like that. We're primarily looking at uh, visual analog ratings. So zero to 10 on fluidity, for instance, or motion economy, which we talked about. And um, you know, these surgeons, they know what they're looking at. They see it all the time. So even if you're not able to describe step by step, uh, you know, there's, there are a variety of techniques to elicit that information. But you, you know, a surgeon say, well, I think this is an eight, or I think this is a six. And we have benchmarks at each of those indicators to suggest, well, this is, this is a 10, this is the most fluid you could be, this is a 10 in economy, this is the most economical, no wasted motion. And uh, part of the research is to see how reliable people can rate. And um, you know, we, we used a variety of techniques to assess the inner rater reliability too. Sure. So, question: Can you use these uh, sort of evaluation methods and, and uh, sort of optimal ways to do this? Can you use those in training for you know, future? So Woodrow and I were talking about this <laughs> in the hall a little earlier today. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and you that know, was that was completely unplanned, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the you know I uh, I kind of drew up just a conceptual dashboard of what a, a formative a formative feedback assessment tool would look like, um, you know, and, and ideally what you could do, since the simulations can be produced cheaply, you set up a simulation on your own, you could set up a webcam on your own, if, for instance, if you're active duty, you could set it up anywhere that you're serving, and uh, just with a webcam and a computer, you could apply these algorithms, and you could achieve a score output, you could, you could see your kinematic report card. So I think that's where the training happens. Sure. You could say, okay, my fluidity has increased from an 8 to a 10. Right. So you can uh, kind of measure over time how you're improving. From, within the limited scope of these sure. scales. Yeah. Sure. So, you know, it's not, you know, a, a completely fluid motion doesn't mean that you completed the surgery. Right. right. Uh, so, for instance, if you sit down and, and you're going to do this, this, this task and you end up conducting an opus, you could be very fluid. But you didn't necessarily do any surgery. Right, <laughs> right. right. <laughs> so there are some limits to the algorithm. And, and those contextual limits need to be taken into account in any training regimen. But given a set of assumptions and, and goodwill of participants, improving from a 6 to an 8 on a fluidity score may be indicative of an improvement towards, well, your, your cyclic rate is improving, your, uh, your, motor, pro your motor programmings, you know, those, <laughs> hopefully yeah. you can adjust that to say motor programs on the record <laughs> rather but, than motor programming. Yeah, so that kind of gets into this yeah. like future looking like what's next, right? Can you kind of speculate on what kind of the next steps in this research would be? Well, I am, I am happy to have said that I just finished my dissertation. So for me, it's uh, taking a deep breath before I move on to the next thing. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> long term, I think there's a lot of opportunity. This, there, the push for objective measures in surgical performance is long lasting. And I think there's a lot of good to be gleaned there. So incorporating these algorithms, uh, I think, is a huge, just a huge area. And active recording in the operating room is still very challenging. We're, we're fortunate enough to have access now to increasing overhead light uh, mounted cameras so we can look at hands, uh, hand motion in the, in the live setting. I think expanding the data bank um, would, be, would be a big avenue for, for immediate. And in the long run, you know, looking at formative assessment tools, right. those training and incorporating that into residency. And uh, what would you... Uh 
what would you think about something like uh, trying to gamify the, the uh, <laughs> <laughs> gamify? Uh, Woodrow? <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, that's all I'm about. I I can't I can't get so, over it. <laughs> yeah. um, Woodrow and I talked about this before. Talking about you know you have a you have perhaps a badge system and and talking about you know perhaps a, a reward structure maybe. And, and you can see how you stack up against your fellow residents or right. you know and, and it's it's not it, you know I, you were talking in in your your interview or I'm sorry in your your paper presentation that uh, it's a very competitive field. Um, everyone everyone there it's um, are very uh, it's a close knit group but they're very competitive. So I, I feel like this kind of being able to see how people are stacking up against each other uh, would kind of tend to bring out the best in people. Um, <laughs> yeah, definitely hopefully. drive yeah. the competition up even further. Exactly. Right? Yeah. yeah. But you so can measure, then you'd be able to measure yourself right. like, against everybody yeah. else. So exactly. That's great idea. Yeah. You know, we, we are, you know, it's, it's nice for me to be able to sit here with you folks and, and, and have this conversation. Uh, recently, the 80 hour work week limit for residents was lifted. Why? Because it wasn't, uh, <laughs> it didn't allow for sufficient training. So I think when we're talking about driving competition into the medical field, you know, I, I think we need to be kind of cautious about where we're putting that and, and the consequences yeah. thereof. There's, sure. there's a good reason for the traditional approach in medicine because those, the, uh, the approaches are usually grounded um, somewhere. Now, it's a, it's a question as to whether or not best practices are shared across the board. If best practices really are best practices, quantitatively, right. uh, perhaps outcomes can be demonstrated to be better in a different technique. You know, and, and this research may uncover some of those techniques. Um, and, but I think you know, we need to be cautious about uh, you know, jumping in to, to push a very, very, an already very strained population <laughs> right. of people. In that way, uh, stacking up against your mentor or stacking up against a different uh, a competitor, it, it might be useful to see where you could compare to a person in the next tranche. Let's say if you're a resident and you say, okay, so my fluidity matches somebody who, um, an attending physician on this tissue. But it, wouldn't, it would need to be contextualized that way. I, I'm not sure it would be very productive to say, you know, I, you know, I outscored Woodrow this round or Woodrow outscored me this round. Um, I think we'd need to be cautious about the, the implications there, right. especially since this tool is being used on a simulated setting. We're not, uh, we're not saying that you'd be a better surgeon just because you're using an economical motion. You know, if, you're, if your sutures leak at the end of your economic motion, you know, that badge might not mean that much to you yeah. at the end of your residency. That's not another yet. way to assess, right? We don't want any trophies or, or achievements for speed running a suture, right? Under three seconds or something. Like. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's why direct observation and mentorship um, is alive and well in the medical community. And, and I think there's good reasons for that. And I think as industrial engineers, we need to be kind of aware and respectful of it. Sure. Uh, at the same time, I think looking at the ways people can use a tool like this uh, in, in an engaged way and with motivation, looking at, you know, maybe you're competing against yourself. Maybe you're competing over time to look at that, and you can share that with your coach, and then um, you can even start to try and coach yourself. Uh, I, think, I think there's a big strength without yeah. kind of driving a wedge into that already, you know, it's a, it's a tough <laughs> for it's sure a, it's a tough charge yeah. so I, I know we're running short on time but um i just want to check in with you to see if any of our listeners want to go and find your work or or keep up with some of the work that you're doing where can they go and find you well uh the ergonomics and biomechanics lab at the university of wisconsin website would be a fine place uh okay. linkedin as LinkedIn. well i'm on linkedin and okay you can great. connect with me there uh and we will we'll post links to all that stuff in our uh show notes so um We'll make sure that that's all there. I'm making sure. Where's the music? <laughs> I, I don't even know. It's live. Hey, guys. There it is. All there right. It is. It's live. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, David, for stopping by and talking to us about your paper. Hey, it's my pleasure. Um, as we sign off, we usually say it depends because, as you know, in the field, it depends on the human. And so uh, I'll just count us down, and we'll all just say it depends. Ready? Three, two, one. It, it depends. depends.